think the, the, the best director are the one who... I don't say that, that they must do film without script, mm. but they must uh, make from that script something of very personal. Now, an encyclopedia asks you to write three lines about Lucchino Visconti. What would you write for them? Uh, I would like to write, it was a good artisan, a good worker. That's all. Lucchino Visconti's passionate and operatic films recreate history with a multicolored intensity. Visconti witnessed many of the great events of the 20th century, and his unique vision is based closely on his own personal experience. He brings the same epic scale to each of his stories, yet the grandeur of his style never obscures the humanity of his subjects and his films are amongst the most subtle ever made. Visconti gave his film about Nazism the same title as Wagner's great opera Gotterdammerum, The Twilight of the Gods. Il titolo wagneriano mi è venuto proprio naturalmente, trattandosi di una specie di di catarsi di dei o considerati semidei non dell'Olimpo e non del Vallalla, ma dei semidei dell'industria, della grande industria tedesca, il titolo mi è venuto proprio naturalmente, Gotter Demmerum, La caduta degli dei. Visconti's favorite theme to which he consistently returns is the family and the complex allegiances and emotional attachments which bind its members together. The original script of The Damned was based on his own family, a dynasty which combined one of Italy's oldest aristocratic families with a great Milanese industrial empire. Questo film è l'esemplificazione di fatti realmente avvenuti in Germania in quel momento e mette il dito soprattutto sulle responsabilità della grande industria in Germania in quel momento, cioè la grande industria si vendette a Hitler. Visconti's picture of a nation drowning in its own moral corruption was deliberately decadent and provocative.
The Damned was the first in a late trilogy of films Visconti set in Germany or based on German authors. For his adaptation of Thomas Mann's novella, Death in Venice, he returned to the world of his own childhood and the tone of the film couldn't be more different or more personal. In Mann's book, Visconti found a character that closely reflected his own, his homosexuality, his approaching death, and his memories of family holidays in the city in which the story is set. It's not a novel, it's a, it's a film. Then I have to change something to be more clear for the audience, you know, because it's a very, very, you know, it's a very delicate story and without many facts, but just with some psychological uh, events. Death in Venice follows the last days of a dying artist who unexpectedly encounters a vision of a beautiful young boy. Visconti examines the fatal impact that the boy's beauty has on his secret admirer. the idea of death which seduced you most about this short story? Not especially death, you know, but this kind of death who is a, an intellectual death, you know, is a story of an intellectual who is following the, the beauty, the, the absolutely beauty in the world, and when he finds it casually in the life, you know, in a young boy who lives at the leader at Hotel de Bain, then he touched with his hand that the, the, the absolutely beauty exists. And, like you know, to put the, put the eyes on the beauty is to put the eyes on the death. For the third film in the trilogy, Visconti went back to a previous era to tell the story of the old German kingdom of Bavaria and its mad monarch Ludwig II. He cast one of the acting sensations of the 1960s, Helmut Berger, who was also his lover in the title role. Ludwig's passions were for commissioning operas by Wagner and building lavish castles. He was part of a pre-20th century aristocracy who were subject to no rules but their own. Young Lucchino grew up in a fairy tale world of castles and servants, so privileged it was almost feudal. The Visconti castle had been lived in by the family since the 14th century, but it had become a partial ruin by the time it was inherited by Visconti's father. 
who embarked on a major program of enlargement and reconstruction. His own wealth was vastly increased by his marriage to Visconti's mother, Donna Carla. She supervised the children's upbringing and education and informed them of their social responsibilities, whilst her husband was absorbed in his own extravagance. He rebuilt the castle. This side of the castle was still there. The two towers are still old and there. Then he rebuilt the other two towers. And, and he thought about building an entire village all around the castle in the 14th century style. It took him at least uh, 40 years. And in 1911, the government gave him the permission to call this place Graziano in Graziano Visconti. And then in 1927, the king of Italy gave him the title of Duke of Graziano Visconti. Lucchino was the fourth of what would eventually be seven children. They were educated by tutors and spent their summers in the castle at Grazzano, or playing in the village their father had designed as a kind of medieval stage set. Questi cosa sono? È una cosa che ho in mente da qualche tempo. Vorrei costruire un castello. Ti ricordi la vallata di Graswam? Sopra Oberammergau. C'è anche un altro posto che mi piace altrettanto. E forse anche di più. Herren Gimze. Sono ancora incerto. Potremmo andarci insieme domani. A cavallo. The Visconti children were brought up to become individuals, worthy of the ancient line into which they had been born. Guido, the eldest, became a professional soldier and fought for Mussolini's fascists during World War II. Anna was their father's favorite. When she grew up, she married a prince and had four children of her own. Luigi developed a passion for horses and became a highly successful gentleman jockey in Milan. Like his brothers, Lucchino was a count in his own right and he shared their father's love of architecture and fine art. Anna inherited the castle at Grazzano and two of her daughters still live there. Molte delle cose che tu vedi dipinte a Grazzano sono state dipinte dal nonno Giuseppe. Lui ha disegnato tutte le case, tutti i progetti, insieme e l'ha fatto con dei muratori, eh, piano piano, un po' alla volta. E adesso ultimamente hanno messo tutti i nomi alle strade. Allora questo è il nome della strada di Carla Visconti, perché è la nonna. E laggiù c'è la strada che si chiama Luchino Visconti. E tutte queste case sono state fatte per la gente che ci, ha, che ci è andata ad abitare e lui chiamava persone a cui poi ha insegnato a lavorare nel legno, nel ferro battuto e moltissime di queste famiglie sono ancora loro, sono i figli, i nipoti che sono sempre rimasti eh, qua, un po' come noi che tutta la vita siamo state qua, io sono stata qua tutta la mia infanzia. Visconti's parents' marriage was a union between the old and the new. His father, Duke Giuseppe, with his stylish clothes and aristocratic good looks, was a favorite of the Italian royal family. His mother, Donna Carla, was a music-loving bourgeois beauty. She was also the heiress to a huge pharmaceutical fortune in Milan.
Qui abbiamo un rapporto molto speciale con sua mamma e lo senti nei suoi lavori. C'è molto la cosa della mamma. Perché era quello che gli assomigliava di più, di carattere. Visconti's mother's family, the Erbas, owned factories producing cosmetics and patent medicines, and she was amongst the richest women in Milan. His parents' marriage was a successful financial alliance, which disguised his father's aristocratic infidelities, and on the surface they were one of the city's most glamorous couples. Palazzo Visconti had its own private theater, the family kept a box at the opera, La Scala, and they were famous for the lavishness of the parties they gave in their enormous ballroom. The Viscontis were one of the oldest families in Milan and could trace their line back as far as the 13th century when they had ruled over almost all Lombardy. The family crest, which shows a serpent eating a child, was brought back by an ancestor from the Crusades where he had taken it from the shield of a fallen Saracen. Milan's massive central fortress was built by Matteo Visconti, who had been elected count of what was then one of the richest city-states in Europe. Visconti's dominated Milan and its history for several centuries. As a boy, Lucchino grew up surrounded by monuments which had been built by his own family. Even Milan's great Gothic cathedral was founded by Archbishop Ottoni Visconti, who established the family dynasty. Vile, crudele come lui. Io ti amo, Rocco. Non mi credi. Ma non capisci che allora è tutto inutile, non vale la pena. Non credo più a niente. Ti prego, Rocco, ti supplico, se continui a parlare così mi butto di sotto. Mi ammazzo, hai capito? Nadia, Nadia, no. senti. Nadia, no. Nadia, fermate. Nadia, senti. No, Rocco, lasciami. Sono morto, Dio. Voglio morire. Nadia. Nadia, fermate. Nadia. Lasciami, ti supplico. Lasciami. Ah. The top of the Milan Cathedral. I know it very well because I'm of Milan, you know. And when I was very young, I remember sometimes I don't went to the school in the morning. And then where I was on the cathedral. And I remember sometimes I I look for the girl and the boy who was fighting, you know. And I remember this. I don't know if you remember in the scene of the top of the cathedral, there are students, they are reading books. They look at Rocco and the girl. And this is me. Ti odio, ti odio, ti odio, ti odio.
The roof of the cathedral was a natural choice for a director whose ancestors had occupied the highest positions in both church and state. They were imperial vicars of the Holy Roman Empire, and they even waged war on the papacy. Visconti himself was named after the ruthless tyrant Lucchino Visconti, who ruled Milan with a rod of iron in the early 14th century. When Visconti was in his teens, his parents' unhappy marriage finally ended in a scandalous separation and an acrimonious battle over his mother's fortune. Mio nonno ha avuto un sacco di storie in giro e lo sapevano tutti e e la nonna è stata mandata via da Graziano, è stata come esiliata e questa è una cosa che ha fatto molto male a molti dei fratelli e compreso lo zio. Lui era quello che più aveva affinità con lei. E poi quando si sono separati i miei nonni lui ha scelto lei, senza discutere proprio. E si sono proprio divisi. Sai, venivano, lui non veniva più qui, mentre da piccolo c'era, era da ragazzo anche, poi quando non veniva più qua. E lei non è mai più venuta qua. È venuta solo per il matrimonio della mia mamma, ma il castello era chiuso. Il matrimonio l'hanno fatto in paese e quindi lei non ha mai più entrato in castello. Veniva a trovare la mia mamma ogni tanto, ma non molto. Poi purtroppo è sempre venuto qua per delle, momenti, delle cose tristi, non so, quando morivano i suoi fratelli o così. Se no veniva poco qua, dopo. Lui, lui amava molto di più i posti della sua mamma. Lucchino was deeply affected by his parents' separation, which effectively split the family in two. Donna Carla retired to the house her parents had built at Cernobio, on the shores of Lake Como. Lucchino was a constant visitor to Villa Erba, and the power of his attachment to his mother became even stronger. He always kept a portrait of her in his bedroom. In his 20s, after a brief career as a cavalry officer, Visconti pursued his own artistic enthusiasms, which included the theater, the new medium of cinema, and opera. Since his childhood, he had been a constant visitor to Italy's grandest opera house, La Scala, in Milan. But he was also drawn to a suitably aristocratic occupation, which he approached with characteristic passion and dedication.
At the improbable age of 26, Visconti trained and bred the winner of Italy's most prestigious racing event, the Milan Gold Cup. Per sette anni io ho svolto l'attività di allevatore e allenatore. E ho vissuto sui campi di corsa, nelle scuderie di cavalli da corsa, per sette anni, come ti dicevo, ed è un'attività molto importante, molto interessante e soprattutto che ti fa fare un'esperienza capitale proprio per la tua vita. Era una malattia di famiglia, nel senso che già i suoi antenati, i suoi nonni, erano tra i fondatori del Jockey Club italiano. I cavalli puro sangue nascono tutti, si dice, da sette stalloni base e da 30 fattrici puro sangue. Ecco, lo zio credo che la sua peculiarità principale fosse di essere uno dei pochi che allora, negli anni 30 in Italia, studiasse sui libri internazionali gli incroci migliori per produrre nella maniera migliore cavalli da corsa. Una delle ultime fattrici possedute da Luchino, che si chiamava Tolbot, e da questa fattrice venne una, una, una femmina basilare per l'allevamento italiano, che si chiamava Talma, che produsse poi due vincitori di derby. Si trovano ancora sulle piste italiane cavalli che vincono gran premi e che vengono dalle fattrici comprate negli anni 30 da Luchino Visconti. Throughout his 20s, Visconti was not just one of the youngest trainers and breeders in Italian racing history, but also one of its most successful. During his racing career, Visconti was a frequent visitor to Paris, where he was introduced to Coco Chanel, the queen of Parisian fashion. Her connections in artistic circles helped him to enter a world which was socially glamorous and intellectually avant-garde. In 1936, he decided to give up his stables in Milan and take an unpaid job as an assistant to the great French director Jean Renoir. Visconti's duties included organizing the costumes during the filming. Uh, dans la partie de campagne, il y a peut-être une chose qui peut vous amuser, c'est que j'ai eu des assistants euh, qui, depuis, ont fait parler d'eux. J'ai eu Visconti, qui m'a bien aidé. J'ai eu Jacques Becker, évidemment, n'est-ce pas J'ai eu Cartier Bresson. Et j'ai eu... Enfin, ça s'est passé... Nous étions une bande de, une bande d'amis et ça s'est passé comme une espèce de d'heureuses vacances au bord d'une très jolie rivière. Life in France altered Visconti's political perspective dramatically. Before leaving Italy, he had flirted with fascism, but Renoir and his circle were all dedicated communists at a time when Europe was moving inexorably towards war. This was really the beginning of uh, the assertion of an independence of your own, wasn't it? Probably, yes. And it took place in Paris? Yes, sure, because my uh, meeting with uh, Jean Renoir was very important for me, because I came from a country where there was uh, fascism, you know, in this moment. Do you remember that, no? Yes, indeed. And then I went in Paris and I met Renoir, an old entourage of Jean Renoir, who was an old young communist. And uh, finally in my life, I begin to, to talk with friends and to, to understand something that I never understood before. This and was I, a very Marxist yes, community, wasn't absolutely. it? absolutely. And uh, from that begin all my work. Visconti became a lifelong communist. But despite his opposition to Mussolini's fascists, he went back to Italy in 1939, on the eve of World War II. 
A few months after his return, his mother died and was buried in the Erba family mausoleum in Milan. Visconti inherited a large part of her share of the family business. Whilst his eldest brother Guido was fighting for Mussolini's army in North Africa, Visconti was determined to try his own hand as a director. In 1942, at the height of the war, he found the money to make his first feature film. He described it as anti-fascist and gave it the powerful one-word title, Obsession. Ossessioni described a social world that could not have been more different to the one that Visconti was brought up in. It was based on a recent American crime thriller called The Postman Always Rings Twice, four years before the Hollywood version of the same book. I know that Ossessione, um, how can I say, Deve molto owes a lot uh, yes. to, 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 to the French and uh, school. Yet, but at the same time, because in Italy in this moment they was making just comedy, rose comedy. And in this moment, to talk about a certain uh, it, it, Italian reality, you know, yes. popular reality, was uh, like uh, if you open a window in a, in a, in a room which is closed for, by 20 years. In the film, the two lovers murder the woman's husband and are forced to flee for their lives. Even though the war itself is never mentioned, their desperation reflects the anxiety of the times. In October 1942, Mussolini's forces and their German allies were decisively defeated at the Battle of El Alamein. Amongst those killed was Visconti's brother Guido, just six months after he had inherited the title of Duke. The year before, their father had died peacefully at his beloved castle in Grazzano. Duke Giuseppe was an unswerving royalist. He was rumored to have been both bisexual and the lover of the Queen of Italy, who appointed him chief courtier at her palace in Rome. After three deaths in quick succession, Visconti was now answerable to no one, and he was also spectacularly wealthy. When Mussolini was deposed in 1943, Italy was occupied by the Germans, and Rome was governed by the Nazis and their Italian collaborators. When Rome was in turn liberated by the Allies, a series of show trials were organized, which unleashed a wave of bloodletting and revenge amongst the Roman population. Visconti was one of the directors hired to film the trials for a documentary, financed by the Italian Communist Party, called Days of Glory. Visconti had spent most of the war in the villa his father had left him in Rome. He took part in the resistance by hiding arms in his garden and he harbored leading communists by disguising them as members of his household staff. In 1944, he himself was imprisoned and interrogated by the authorities. At the time of his arrest, he was in disguise 
but the initials LV embroidered on his shirt gave his identity away. During the occupation, the house was requisitioned by the Germans. Visconti later evoked this period in his masterpiece, The Damned. For days of glory, Visconti filmed in the courtroom where the show trials took place. Many of his comrades in the resistance had been tortured and killed by the very men he now turned his cameras on. Visconti himself was called as a witness in the trial of the most notorious defendants. Caruso, the head of the fascist police, and Koch, the suave head of security, who had arrested him and conducted his interrogation. When he was asked whether he would support death sentences for the accused, Visconti said yes. When the war was over, Visconti once again put his cinema at the service of his political ideals with a film that began as a documentary called La Terra Trema. For the Terra Trema, that was my second movie. I had some money for the Communist Party and I, I went in Sicily like this with the idea to, to do just a documentary, you know, on the life of uh -huh. the Sicilian fishermen. And this was the beginning, in the sense that we begin to look at the reality of our country. But I was convinced exactly. to be very objective. Mm. I, I was not, because you can never be completely objective in art. You That's know, right. you are always yourself. Visconti quickly abandoned the idea of making a documentary and got the fishermen to act out their own story. It's a method which has been imitated many times since. There are no actors, you know? This is the, 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 the great experience I make. I know that to be herself, to be sincerely herself, it's very easy. You know, it's when you begin to construct that it begins to be difficult. Some stories need real actors. Then I, I like great actors, very great. If they are not great, I prefer to take people that uh, that is uh, exactly what I want, you know, and they correspond exactly to what I, I think, but they are not actors. Oh, questo sono io. Questo sicuramente sono io. Gli stivali, già che questa è una cosa di tela, mi ricordo, un passaporto, questa roba non ce l'ho più. Perché si ricorda, ma non è che mi assomigliavo tanto, comunque. Tutti i vestiti, il cappello bianco, questo ce l'avevo io, eh? originale questo, no? io, per andare a pescare, per... cosa è? questa è proprio tutta roba mia, un padre, cioè il pantalone non si capiva qual era il suo, tutti pieni di, di cose, e mi ricordo che la madre me le devo cucire perché allora non c'era da, da, da fare. Eh? Il programma lo facevamo giorno per giorno, ma no, stavamo lì in esposizione, <ride> sapevo quello che voleva, non, non c'era via di mezzo, <ride> stabiliva quella cosa e basta. Poi sai, Visconti, ma se io una parola, <ride> era come, come Hitler, che ne so, <ride> era sentito, non è? Questi sono 
dei disegnini che io facevo rapidamente per rappresentare gli attori, i personaggi che erano nell'inquadratura per i raccordi per la continuità. Questa è la scena quando rammendano le reti e parlano tra di loro i pescatori, fanno le considerazioni sulle loro condizioni di lavoro e, e cominciano a pensare di potersi ribellare ai padroni delle barche. Finito di girare una scena andavano a casa per mangiare, per dormire, ma non capivano che cosa fosse un raccordo, cioè la necessità, se avevano girato una scena con la barba, la necessità che dovevano mantenersi la barba per la continuità. E io mi trovavo davanti della gente che improvvisamente non aveva più la barba. Franco Rosi, one day, <laughs> we, both, we done our best job during Terra Trema, and one day they didn't unload the fish in proper way, proper place, and the camera was somewhere else, and so he stopped the whole thing and he attacked us. The two of us, come here, come here, and you think you can go ahead in this kind of profession where it's required attention, intelligent, talent, da, 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 da. you are this and that. It's heaviest names you can think of. Franco Rossi was absolutely shattered. He said, I cannot wonder this being insulted like that in front of those fishermen. I have no more authority with them and all of this. I wanted to go back to, to Naples. And I spent the night to convince him that one day you'll do like him. Because when we are like a general on a trench, you know, on the front line, he don't, he don't spare words, he just say what comes to your mouth. And I convinced him to stay, but this country was really shocking. The constant problems of filming with non-professionals in an isolated and difficult location increased the cost of the film considerably. Per un certo periodo di tempo ci sono stati i soldi, poi sono finiti i soldi e allora Visconti ha cominciato a finanziare in parte il film con i suoi mezzi personali. Ha venduto anche dei beni personali di famiglia. I soldi a beautiful apartment house to finance La Terra Trema. He needed money, he said, well, take that. He sold some jewels of his mother. Or this uh, apartment house, instead of uh, selling it, you know, find the right buyer and make, get the right price, he sold it for nothing, just to, to finance and finish the film. He sold it for one-tenth of the value. Yeah. But he got the money, cash, to keep uh, the production going. I love the idea that uh, the real characters of this village of fishermen in, in Sicily were playing themselves, but themselves up to a certain point. If you had to have a priest, you wanted to have a real priest. If you had the role of a policeman, you took a policeman. It's fine when you have to play the policeman or play the priest. But if you <coughs> ask that policeman <coughs> to rape a girl of 16, <coughs> then that man you will not perform that. So, you see what I mean? Or the priest uh, getting mo being bribed by a mafioso, if a real priest will never do it, so you need an actor to perform the role. So it was something jarring all the time. The whole principle creaks when you must have reality, reality, reality but we managed at the end to create a canvas, believable canvas, which was not reality, but was not, at the same time, was not funny. It was the real people. And uh, it has a purity that no other film was going to have. Six months after they had arrived, Visconti and his crew finally left the village of Acitrezza. La Terra Trema was quickly recognized as one of the masterpieces of Italian cinema, and it established Visconti as a director of vision and authority. Il 
Io contemporaneamente sono partito da Roma con lui e sono andato ospite lui a casa sua. Stavo. Come mai è partito con lei? Ma non so, sono stato simpatico, non so perché. Di tutti quanti ha scelto me. It was a kind of uh, mascot, like a charm for the crew. And then at the end, like the dogs, the, some of the crew had kept with them for six months and then they couldn't leave them behind and brought them at home. And so Visconti did the same with uh, Ignazio. And he taught him uh, these strict rules of uh, a good butler, and the boy has been butler with him for 20 years. I primi tempi lo chiamava Visconti quando giravamo in Sicilia, poi a casa sua lo chiamava Conte. Lui a casa sua manteneva, c'erano 5 6 persone di servizio e lui era una persona sola, insomma. C'era il cuoco, la guardarobiera, quelle che facevano le pulizie, la casa è grandissima. Mi piacere che il giardino fosse in ordine, quei fiori e tutto, che la genderia fosse lucida, che tutte queste cose così, insomma. Però c'era tutto a gusto suo tutto a gusto di Visconti, come doveva fare, lo diceva lui, questo qui, questo là, i fiori, quello che voleva, sì, sì, c'erano i fiori, tutto. Mi hanno fatto dei regali grandi, mi è arrivata la notte fino a una macchina. Oggi macchina non niente, ma allora nel 60 una macchina era un valore, non tutti ce l'avevano. Franco Zeffirelli was Visconti's main assistant in both the cinema and the theatre. He had also been his lover since they met in 1946, and he too lived in the villa in Rome. I remember <laughs> when I went to live with him, the ritual of a fork and knife and fork and knife and fork and knife and glass and glass and glass and glass and, glass and uh, white wine with fish and red wine with other, and liqueur at the end and coffee in a certain way and just, well, there were the counts of Milano, you know, brought up the most extraordinary, exquisite. They had nannies, they had teachers, they had uh, access to everything. Di quella pira l'orrendo fuoco Tutte le pire marte a bambo In his first color film, Visconti returned to the world of his own class and to his first love, the opera. Most film directors haven't a clue about opera and have never done it. But he did. He was in love with it. He adored the theater and opera and film. And he brought a theatricality to the films. That had a great deal to do with his not being afraid to be extravagant in a film you know, the emotions or, or the, the settings or whatever. Basta! È troppo tardi, finito! Io non sono il tuo romantico eroe! E non ti amo più. Volevo dei soldi, li ho avuti, basta. Vesconti really took his time, as opposed to Hollywood, because that's always, you know, hurry up and get it done as fast as you can. It's costing money. He would uh, have fresh flowers every day in all the big rooms, no matter whether, you know, he was going to shoot there or not. And on Friday nights, the men from Lux Films would come up, and the, these little men in the black suits, you know, and they were talking to him, bothering him, and he got mad. And Way at the end of this hallway was a table and a bunch of flowers. And he walked down the hallway where we were to this table, picked up the flowers, threw them on the floor and stamped on them and said, mad, 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 you, you know, you're driving me crazy. Leave me alone, go away. And they just ran. They just practically ran out. <laughs> he was outrageous in that respect. He really was. Vai, 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 signora! Vai, vai, scoltrina! Vai, vai, mira, rompi il collo, non fermarti! He 
liked very much to have an opportunity of shouting, bam, breaking things, at the path, throwing china against the walls, and, uh, breaking mirrors. Lucina was always looking for the moment where he could unload, open up this furnace of passion that he had within him. And as he was an outrageously powerful personality, is uh, opening up the hearts where, like a you know, volcano exploding, there was no moderation. It was not a subtle. Mm -mm. He lingered over the moments where passion was uh, coming up. Visconti directed operas and plays throughout his career in the cinema. When he first worked with Maria Callas, she was famous for her extraordinary voice, but he transformed her into one of the most powerful stage performers of all time. First of all, I must say about Lucchino, he is a gentleman. I was thoroughly spoiled by him before we even started working together because he was, uh, the Grand Seigneur was treating the uh, prima donna so lavishly and uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I don't know whether I'm really always on that pedestal for him or for others, but uh, I felt it in his work with me. He taught me something without my, uh, his knowing it, that the less I move without evident reason or profound reason, the more it is my own personality. Did me enormous good, of course. Visconti revolutionized an art form that had become stiff and moribund by making it dramatic and psychologically convincing. You know, opera can be easily ridiculous, no matter how good the uh, director is. The way of expression is very old-fashioned, so it's uh, very, very difficult to handle. Of course, many people will find it absolutely astonishing that you, who have been uh, uh, so concerned with the truth of the cinema and with exquisite acting on the uh, uh, stage, um, can take so much of what is called Hamish acting uh, in the Not opera. Hamish acting. Why is no? you say that? that is, no, I mean, this is, the, this is the normal opinion yes. of opera. The very uh, worst opinion is if an opera is uh, well directed and well produced and uh, with good singer. I don't think that there can be another genre of artistic. Visconti is still renowned as Italy's greatest ever director of opera. threw me out practically after five years. And I was so precious for him because I, I was a assistant director in cinema and theater. I was decorating. I was answering the phones. I was paying the bills. I was walking the dogs. I was doing everything. Out of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take your dogs. Go. Never violent physically, but my God, that tongue. I was told that, you know, he, he was a communist. Lucchino, who was a billionaire, you know, and royalty, was also a communist, which uh, I, I, I don't know how it all worked with him, but it did. <laughs> there was a, a celebration for some day of the Communist Party, I don't know what it was, 
and there was this man walking around on the set and Franco Zaffarelli came to me and said if Lucchino wants to have you take a picture with him and that man don't do it because he's the head of the Communist Party here. And I just thought he was some weird man, <laughs> a weird guy, I didn't know who he was. I think that's one of the reasons that the film was never released in the United States because that was the time of the witch hunts, McCarthyism. All that terrible stuff that went on here. I was terribly upset because I thought that the film was gorgeous and beautiful and fascinating, and I thought I was very good in it, and I was upset that it wasn't shown. BBC Four Zone returns tomorrow with the concluding part of the life and times of Count Lucchino Visconti. And you can see one of his early masterpieces, Ossessioni, on BBC Four this Wednesday at 10. Over on BBC Four now, Cradle of Life, followed by a new series, What If, discussing what the repercussions of John Major's affair with Edwina Curry would have been if it had been made public at the time. That's at half past midnight.